Hello, I'm Richard Murphy, and this is the first in a series of videos that I'm making on the subject of tax havens, or secrecy jurisdictions, as I would prefer to call them. Now, I've been looking at the issues around tax havens for a long time. I'm a chartered accountant. I became aware of this issue in the 1980s when I was trained in how to use tax havens by the firm which first employed me. It was called Pete Marwick Mitchell & Co. Now the P and the M from that name are part of KPMG, one of the largest firms of accountants in the world. So this issue is a perennial for every single accountant who's working in the world now. For me, it became a particular issue of concern when I decided to, by and large, give up my accounting practice and to instead concentrate on tax justice campaigning. Now that happened from 2003 onwards, and John Christensen and I, who co-founded the Tax Justice Network, decided to focus our attention on tax havens and the abuses that they permitted. There were, however, problems in concentrating on that singular issue, and that was because, as we discovered, it was incredibly difficult to define precisely what a tax haven was. Tax havens do a wide variety of things, and they are by no means homogenous in their outlook and view and what they supply. So the UK is a tax haven in some senses because it facilitates large numbers of offshore banking transactions through the City of London. So too is Jersey a tax haven, but it's very different. It facilitates the operation of large numbers of trusts in particular that are used by people to hide their assets in offshore structures, which therefore may move them out of regulation or tax. Ireland is a tax haven by offering a low tax rate. The Netherlands is a tax haven by offering a different form of low tax rate. It does it on funds that simply pass through the country. The point is that when we tried to look at tax and whether there was a tax rate or not a tax rate or a high tax rate or a low tax rate, what we came up against was the problem that because different tax havens were abusing different parts of the international tax system so that each had its own distinct offering to make to someone who might want to use it, we couldn't come up with some one single definition on the basis of tax alone that defined what a tax haven was. But, and that but is really important, what we realised was that there was something else at least as important when it came to tax havens that they all had in common. And that thing they had in common was secrecy. And secrecy is key to understanding what a tax haven is. Because, let's be blunt about it, quite a lot of the things that take place in tax havens were either illegal, and that was very commonplace when we were first talking about this issue in 2003, or at least now considered to be socially undesirable, which is perhaps more common in 2021. But in either case, they are a cause of at the very least deep social embarrassment to those who might use them, or a potential risk to their freedom and well-being. So, it is common to everybody who uses a tax haven that they do not want people to know what they're doing in those places. And secrecy, once we realised that that was the key issue that tied all these places together, became the basis for our definition of what a tax haven was. We in fact took a term, I took a term, that was used by Senator Carl Levin in the USA. Senator Carl Levin was an exceptionally effective chair of the Senate Investigations Committee, which he used to look at companies who were abusing tax havens. And I met him and was pleased to contribute to small parts of his work, perhaps, over time. But he used this term called secrecy jurisdictions, but he never quite defined it. And when John and I came to actually set up the Financial Secrecy Index, which was the first major research output in some senses of the Tax Justice Network, we realised that there was no point in measuring tax abuse because we couldn't by the standards that I've already just discussed in these places, but we could very definitely measure the secrecy that they offer. And that required as well that we had a definition of what a tax haven was. So what I did was create a definition. It's linked in the paper that is below this video, and so you could read it in more detail there. But effectively, I said a tax haven is a place 
that creates legislation for the benefit of people who do not live there. In other words, literally foreigners to that place. Tax havens do not operate for the benefit of the people who are resident in the location, but for people from outside it. And what is more, what that tax haven does is provide a deliberate veil of secrecy around the structures that are used to take advantage of that legislation that is designed to undermine the law in another place. And that veil of secrecy is maintained so that the people who are undertaking the abuse cannot be identified. So critically, and let's repeat this in a different way because that might be important, we have a place, a tax haven or secrecy jurisdiction if you like, which create laws for people other than those who don't live there. Why would it do that? Because it wants to bring in professional services business. What does that law do? It undermines the regulation of another country. That regulation may be to do with tax, but as I will explore later in this series, it could be to do with a whole range of other issues as well. However, the secrecy jurisdiction knows only too well that what it is doing is, well, socially unacceptable at the very least, and maybe it is facilitating illegality, and therefore they create this secrecy. What does that secrecy mean? It means that you can have a trust, but not identify who the real beneficiaries of that arrangement are. It means you can have a company, but not actually put its accounts on public record, and very often not put its ownership and the true nature of those who control the company as directors on public record. It means that you can have a bank account, at least historically, and not disclose who the true owner was to a domestic tax authority of the place where the person who has that account might have been located. I have to stress that one has by and large changed, but that was certainly true when we started. And so this secrecy was established to make sure that those making use of the tax haven could do so, well, in relative peace and quiet, knowing full well that the veil of secrecy that they put around their activities would be sufficient to hide that abuse from the eyes of the authorities who might want to know about it. And that is fundamentally what a tax haven still is. It is this place that sells secrecy to permit abuse. Abuse of tax law by all means, but please remember abuse of other laws too, employment law, environmental law, competition law, and also just abuse of the creditors of a company, hiding its trading from view, hiding its assets and liabilities from view, and even, frankly, abuse of family arrangements, just simply hiding from view the assets that a one spouse in a marriage owns from the other one in case a divorce comes along. These are the uses of tax havens and the use of that secrecy. And underlying it all is one common theme. Tax havens facilitate cheating. And that is another theme that I'll return to later in this series of videos. But first of all, understand that secrecy is the key product that is used to make sure that people do not realize that someone is abusing the facilities that a tax haven provides. And they're doing that because whatever that facility is, you can be pretty darn sure it's antisocial. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in what I've been saying in this video, please subscribe. There is a button below the viewing screen. If you're interested in what I have to say on Twitter, I'm at Richard J. Murphy on that medium. If you want to look at my blog, that's taxresearch.org.uk. And we have a Facebook page as well, Richard J. Murphy. So one of those things will get you more information on what this video series is about. And I hope I'll see you again soon.